So this guy also in Mifan's team is out in the field. You've seen it all, um, I think. <laughs> what do they say? You've forgotten more than I'll ever know about containers. So we've got about 30 minutes, and if we want to save time for questions, fire away. Uh, so I will talk about uh, how containers have affected how we uh, build, deploy, test uh, applications. Uh, and then uh, let's see. Uh, depending on the time, uh, let's. Uh, I'll I'll do some uh, basic demo on how this uh, how it it look like. So you've been hearing this all week. Uh, so we've been uh, the architectures are disaggregating to help uh, companies uh, scale and work at the internet internet scale. And uh, one of the ways that we can do that easily is by using uh, containers. Uh, and also containers has fundamentally changed and altered how we build applications. And we look at uh, what are the characteristics uh, that make makes container native and how those have affected how we build uh, new applications. Uh, so Docker has basically uh, popularized uh, using containers. So you start from a base image and then maybe add your code uh, or, or, or the runtime that you, that, that you want and then add any other dependencies uh, that's necessary to run it, uh, and then you build your container. And after that, uh, for using the container, you push your image uh, to a registry, and then you pull uh, uh, from that registry, and then uh, you, you start using that container. And when you have multiple services going on, you can do this all day. You can uh, start creating containers. But there has to be a way to manage uh, containers. So Paul talked about uh, during his keynote that uh, one of his customers or one of his friends has like 200 microservices, and the lead developer doesn't know what each uh, service is doing. So there has to be a way to manage uh, these containers uh, uh, better. And Kubernetes gives uh, that uh, in a very nice uh, developer-friendly uh, framework and an API. Uh, and also there are other technologies uh, that's coming to the picture, like service mesh technologies that allow you to do uh, some of the cool things uh, that, that we talk about. And it's, it's all about, again, uh, as uh, I'm borrowing slides from Paul's keynote, so it's all about developer flow, uh, how, how uh, we make the development process more agile, and at the same time, how, how we take advantage of the container uh, nativeness of things uh, we, we, we write. So we look look at uh, look a uh, couple of couple of these characteristics. Uh, so how we package and deployment, and how we do service discovery, and highly available and scalability deployments, and then configuration management when it comes to managing different uh, configuration uh, properties, and then security uh, monitoring and then continuous uh, integration and de uh, deployment. Uh, so on packaging wise, it's it's really. Uh, uh, important to use uh, smaller base images, and also you can use a platform specific images. Like for example, uh, Node.js provide like a Node.js uh, Docker image, uh, and you can use that to start uh, as a base image to add your own logic. And also you have to uh, be careful about uh, using uh, base images. So uh, the image right here uh, sh show you that uh, uh, th these are the base images uh, that that build. Uh, open JDK uh, into the image itself. Uh, right at the bottom, if you look at the size of the image, uh, it's like the JDK 10 with uh, Debian. It's almost 1 GB in size. So you will be adding uh, like a very simple program. But again, you are depending on like a, a huge dependency on the size. So it, it's not uh, basically uh, going to give you a lot of performance. Uh, so there are multiple ways you can reduce this uh, size. Uh, for JDK, you can use the Alpine-based image, which is about 100 MB. And uh, in OpenJDK specifically, there is an effort to run the OpenJDK on top of uh, Alpine uh, MuscleLib natively. So that uh, even further reduces the size, size of the uh, image. So using the lo uh, like a, a very uh, small image, it's easy to push to registries. It, it, it's very easy to uh, pull images from registries and then uh, start using these uh, containers. And also, uh, from a packaging point of view, uh, there are uh, you can use things like a Helm uh, project uh, or Helm charts, which allows you to group certain uh, 
uh, related resources together. If you have like uh, multiple services uh, and on and using a database and using a uh, uh, other components, you can group these uh, deployment into a single uh, deployment file and use that as a single uh, packaging unit uh, when you do uh, deployments. And also it, it'll, it gives you the flexibility to do uh, version releases and also you can fall back uh, and ro roll back uh, and uh, move between uh, releases and versions. So really uh, Docker packaging gives us a very consistent and repeatable uh, predictable deployment artifacts. So there is uh, no room for that. It works on my machine, but it, when you deploy something, there's an uh, error. Uh, uh, so that's, that, that has happened uh, far too often, uh, more, more often than, than we <laughs> would like to, I guess. And in the deployment time, uh, bas basically when you are deploying into a container uh, orchestration environment, there are certain artifacts uh, or certain uh, configuration files that you have to build. Uh, in order to be able to deploy into uh, Kubernetes. And uh, Kubernetes, uh, one, one of the, uh, initially one of the main uh, sort of complaints uh, about Kubernetes is that, okay, now you have your container, uh, you build your program, you build your uh, Docker image out of it, and now you have to figure out how to build these YAML files. Uh, so there are technologies that uh, allows you to create these YAML artifacts uh, automatically. Uh, so one on the left is uh, using uh, Ballerina. You'll probably uh, learn about this, uh, more about this, and in depth uh, tomorrow. And on the right side, it's a, a, a relatively new project called MetaParticle, uh, which is also trying to give uh, like an annotation-driven approach uh, to things like Java, Python, etc. So you don't have to deal with uh, manual YAML file creation. And then at the deployment time, uh, you, 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 using the container, net, container tools and the orchestration tools, you can uh, sort of play around and identify uh, how your application or service behaves uh, in a clustered uh, environment when you have multiple nodes uh, running on the same code. Uh, and also uh, uh, things, when you, when you have a service mesh technologies that allows you to do things like uh, selective uh, injection of failures at, at multiple points. Uh, so when you have a microservice environment, let's say uh, like a 200 microservice in, uh, services, one service depending on like 10 other services, uh, and if you have a, an error in the middle, it's very hard to predict how a cascading failure looks like from either the UI uh, or the application point of view. Uh, so this gives, gives us a flexible uh, tool chain that you can selectively inject failures without having to explicitly code that uh, in the application. And then, of course, once you uh, identify that, you can take measures at the code level to include uh, some of this, uh, uh, some of this uh, error handling logic uh, into your program itself. Uh, and also, this uh, tool chain uh, allows you to decouple your code from uh, uh, having to take dependencies on complex bolt-on frameworks uh, to do specific uh, error handling. Uh, for example, one of the uh, one of the uh, popular frameworks to do uh, error handling is Netflix uh, Hystrix. So you had to take a dependency on that, and then uh, you had to use libraries uh, or constructs provided by the library itself uh, to do error handling. And if you look at uh, uh, things like Ballerina, there are certain uh, resiliency patterns built into the language. So that allows you to sort of use the, the language built in constructs rather than having to take dependencies on external uh, complex uh, frameworks. And also, uh, you can do uh, application agnostic error handling uh, as well. So some of the uh, service mesh uh, frameworks, uh, specifically Istio, uh, allows you to do uh, certain retries, uh, configure retries automatically when you are trying to connect to a service endpoint. And if uh, the service is some, some, somehow fails, you can uh, configure automatic retries. And, and, and that, again, uh, at the deployment time, uh, the, the container nativeness and the, the tool chain around containers uh, helps us to identify uh, errors early in, in the, the lifecycle rather than having to deploy. Now you, have, you deploy your service into a, a shared environment or a staging or production, and then you, you uh, bump into an issue at deployment time. So you can identify those issues very early. And also, you can selectively uh, sort of emulate error conditions, and then uh, specifically, uh, if you are not uh, sort of uh, 
So sometimes sometimes we can't predict uh, a behavior of an error. So you, you can identify this uh, early on. So service discovery is again uh, very important when you have uh, a large microservice cluster, uh, having being able to uh, address uh, different services uh, in, in a very uh, uh, effortless uh, manner. So there are uh, multiple ways that, uh, for example, Kubernetes uh, allow you to do uh, service discovery. So when when you create certain pods, uh, Kubernetes will inject automatically uh, through environment variables. Uh, so you can look up uh, service name. Uh, service host and port, and then connect uh, to that service. And also, Kubernetes allows you to do DNS-based discovery, and it, it's really the recommended way uh, you can uh, ad address these services uh, using uh, DNS. And also, uh, when you have uh, 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 service mesh technologies, uh, the, the service mesh itself uh, inject, uh, will inject uh, to the pod as a sidecar. And then from your application, you will be making a, like a local call and then discover uh, services uh, through a proxy, uh, si through the proxy uh, sidecar. And again, yeah, in a distributed, uh, and when you have multiple endpoints, a service, so you can't really live without uh, service discovery. Uh, and you have to uh, have that uh, in place without having to uh, manually hard code or read that uh, entry from a config file. And uh, uh, scalability and high availability is again uh, a key part. So you can test uh, these some of the uh, high available aspects, uh, and especially uh, when you ha when you uh, when you code your application, how how it will uh, function in a cluster, and then uh, uh, identify the behavior. Uh, we've uh, ha we've had we've had situation where uh, now a developer has deployed developed the application and deployed uh, into an environment. And the operations uh, people have uh, scaled that deployment into multiple nodes. And then all of a sudden, uh, something of the application fails. So usually, uh, this sees with stateful calls. So when you uh, have stateful calls, and when you try to uh, load balance between uh, using a load balancer in a round robin fashion, the state uh, is again lost. So you have to, the ops person uh, then have to get into a call, discuss, and understand about the application behavior. And then uh, we get to know, OK, this you can't really uh, scale uh, uh, horizontally. You have to have the, the sticky sessions in the load balancer configured in order to make that work. Uh, so Kubernetes especially allows you to uh, code that or, or create that uh, in the artifact itself. Uh, so you can use uh, a stateful set where when you are scaling a particular uh, application. And when you scale up the deployment uh, using the using Kubernetes uh, replication uh, controller, it will basically do a stateful uh, replication. So the operations person doesn't have to worry about uh, have, under, trying to understand what, what the application uh, is doing. And this, again, uh, really uh, allows us to reduce uh, deployment level uh, surprises uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, application state. Uh, so configuration management is again a very popular uh, use case with uh, uh, these uh, container management tools. Uh, especially uh, Kubernetes allows you to do uh, inject uh, configuration dynamically into running pods uh, through configuration maps. And this basically decouple your uh, image and the application logic uh, from the configuration uh, that you have that, that you will be uh, reading uh, uh, in your running uh, program. And also, it'll, it gives you flexibility to do uh, secret management. Uh, so when you, when you are dealing with passwords, when you are dealing with keys, uh, tokens, uh, you can uh, take advantage of the secret management capabilities, and it will uh, encrypt and then be available to the running uh, pods uh, dynamically. And again, uh, this construct uh, effortlessly distribute these uh, configuration entries between a cluster. So you don't have to worry about uh, at, the, at the deployment time. There are no uh, special, um, uh, special constructs or special deployment options that you have to take to distribute the configuration uh, spe specifically. And the configuration entries are basically decoupled from code. Uh, and uh, if you use, uh, you probably, uh, again, you'll see this uh, tomorrow in detail. Uh, uh, Ballerina allows you to sort of read these configuration files uh, again through a config package that's built into the language, uh, and we, we can pass config. And the Ballerina again, uh, when you have configuration bits, 
will automatically create the configuration maps uh, for you. And it's essentially from an application uh, development point of view, it, it basically unifies how we access uh, configuration information and how, how, how we are dealing with uh, uh, external access calls uh, when you have to make uh, ex external calls and talk to uh, maybe database connections uh, or external service uh, calls. So security wise having uh, smaller uh, images is uh, crucial so it, it reduce your uh, possible uh, attack surface uh, and also if you use uh, uh, things like uh, uh, gcp and there are there are other sort of providers that uh, provide this facility as well they will automatically uh, scan the the docker image for uh, vulnerabilities and then you, if there are vulnerabilities you can update uh, based, based on that and in Kubernetes, uh, you can create different uh, namespaces as well and isolate your services into different uh, uh, sort of isolated namespaces. And also at, at the deployment time, it allows you to uh, create different quotas uh, for namespaces to reduce uh, CPU uh, and memory uh, footprint. And also uh, network level isolation uh, at, uh, when you are defining a network policy you'll be able to define your uh, ingress uh, and e uh, egress uh, tools. And this actually, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, when you use a service mesh technology like Istio, uh, you can uh, restrict uh, ingress and also egress uh, rules uh, effortlessly uh, using the Istio uh, control plane. And uh, another cool thing that, that, that's provided by the, 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 the service mesh uh, te technologies is automatic a mutual SSL authentication between your services or between your pods. So you don't have to configure uh, certificates or you, you don't have to deal with uh, certificates at all. And the application that you write uh, doesn't know about uh, any certificate or any certificate management. It's basically handled transparently uh, for you. And through the control plane, you can control uh, a lot of the policies that you push uh, into your uh, so, so containers and microservices uh, and also have the same policies across different uh, uh, environments or different stages of your life cycle. And another cool thing that you get out of the box with this tool is uh, monitoring and distributed tracing. So usually uh, you get monitoring out of the box from the application uh, developer point of view. There is no special constructs. There's no special uh, agent or there's no special uh, statistics push that you have to do. Uh, and if you want distributed tracing, you just have to uh, sort of uh, forward certain HTTP headers and you will automatically get distributed tracing support uh, through, through, the, the, uh, through uh, uh, Prometheus and also visualize through uh, a Grafana that's typically built into the service uh, mesh uh, projects that, that you'll probably find. Uh, yeah, and basically, uh, application developer uh, doesn't have to uh, know anything about the the, uh, the um, uh, metrics collection. And uh, on the continuous uh, integration and con continuous uh, development uh, uh, cycle, there are uh, multiple uh, technologies. So you can use uh, Helm charts to create like a deployment uh, artifact or de a complete deployment, a complete version deployment, and also you can do rolling updates. Uh, and uh, and as a developer, you also get to get a chance to uh, work with uh, how your program behaves using a canary deployment. So canary is basically you have you selectively uh, send a, a percentage of traffic uh, to a certain version of a service, and you can gradually increase that uh, load later on. Uh, and typically, blue green is you have one deployment, and you switch over uh, to another uh, deployment, and also allows you to do uh, A/B testing uh, with ease. Uh, so I'll uh, quickly show you a, a very uh, 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 small uh, demo of how, how these tool chains uh, work. So I'm not sure whether you can. Is a font better? So. Uh, so I'll first show my uh, code. So uh, 
Here I have a very simple uh, ballerina service. So what it does is uh, you see a hello uh, a v2 from uh, and uh, I'm appending the host name of the running pod uh, to this service uh, and then just uh, sending it back. And here I'm using uh, ballerina uh, Kubernetes annotations to generate uh, Kubernetes uh, artifacts. So what I have uh, done is uh, I have uh, created this uh, deployment annotation, given a name, uh, given uh, what my image uh, should be should be called, and then I have exposed this as a uh, service uh, in, in Kubernetes. And then all you have to do is. Uh, 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 ballerina build uh, service uh, US service file. And as you see, this, this will automatically generate the, the Kubernetes artifact. So, you, so you, you don't have to generate any YAML files uh, by your hand at all. So first of all, it will uh, uh, create the Kubernetes uh, deployment files. And also, it will create automatically create the Docker image uh, for this uh, service with the service logic. Uh, built in, and here I and and then uh, you you can it, give, if it gives the command to uh, run this uh, artifact. Uh, so it, it creates. Uh, if you look at uh, Kubernetes under Kubernetes directory, uh, there's a Docker with a Docker file, and it'll all also generate the the uh, the image of, of this. And there's a service uh, uh, YAML file and the uh, deployment uh, YAML file. So I've already uh, deployed uh, this service. So if you look at uh, kubectl, uh, kubectl get pods, you will see there's one uh, pod running. Uh, and then I can invoke this. Uh, I have a, a loop uh, that invoke this. So you'll see uh, hello from v2, and, and we have the host name uh, appended to it. And now you, you can uh, use uh, Kubernetes API uh, to see how, you, how your program behaves uh, in, a, in a clustered uh, deployment. So in this case, it's a very simple, uh, very simple uh, service. Uh, but I'll say, uh, let's see. Yep. Get deployment, and you see uh, you have one pod here. So I can say kube control scale. Deployment uh, and my deployment service. And now if you look at uh, kube control get pods, you'll see that uh, now uh, there are three services running. And if you look at uh, this now, uh, you'll see uh, now it, it automatically load balance between these uh, services. And uh, here, uh, uh, I've, uh, so, so it's basically the v version two of the service that is now have three instances. And uh, also I've built uh, another version of this. I just changed. Uh, v2 to v3 and I have I've built uh, the, the Kubernetes artifacts and I've deployed it already. Uh, now also I can uh, ba basically do a rolling upgrade of this service from version 2 to version 3. And uh, the moment you do this, and if you look at uh, the, your requests, uh, it'll start uh, slowly now uh, from, uh, it'll create uh, version 3 of the service and then uh, you'll start uh, getting uh, responses uh, back. Uh, so if you look at uh, kube, kube control get pods, you'll see the version 2 now is being terminated and version 2, version 3 is uh, up and running. And if you look, if you pay attention to uh, this uh, number, usually it, it should be uh, one of one. Uh, right now I'm uh, also using uh, uh, a conduit uh, service mesh. That's why you see uh, that's a, the, the sidecar proxy uh, count as a second uh, second pod and uh, i'll keep the keep the loop running and then uh, i'll go to the dashboard uh, the conduit dashboard and if you open up uh, the metrics uh, dashboard you can see uh, it basically uh, you can see some statistics uh, related to uh, the service and the number of uh, requests uh, 
requests that, that are that are coming in. So this uh, entire thing uh, you get for free. You don't have to uh, do uh, anything. Uh, basically, have have uh, run, you just have to have the Kubernetes uh, uh, cluster running, and then uh, uh, have the service mesh uh, automatically deployed uh, uh, in, into the Kubernetes cluster. And once we inject uh, that, uh, and as you see, uh, I don't have anything on metrics collection on my service at all. Uh, so just uh, have the the business logic uh, here, and you'll get uh, a lot of the rich tool set uh, from from uh, Kubernetes and related service mesh uh, projects. And uh, that that's uh, about it. So we basically went through how how container container tool chain have. Uh, uh, changed how we develop, build, deploy cycles, and how this, uh, again, Tyler mentioned that it's all about being able to uh, or bring, bringing uh, agility uh, to, to the development process and also the, the integration logic uh, that, that uh, we, are, we are writing. And, uh, and also, container native characteristics help us, uh, help developers to uh, identify problems faster and then uh, uh, think about uh, uh, the problems uh, very early on at the development uh, cycle rather than uh, waiting until things get deployed uh, and then identify problems that, that way. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, would love to answer any questions if you have any. So basically, the question is, uh, we talked about service discovery. And I changed from pods uh, 1 to 3, and which endpoint I'm, I was uh, talking. Uh, so endpoint is basically, uh, one, one, Kubernetes allows you to, uh, there's an abstraction called Kubernetes services. So once you create a service, uh, it creates a load balanced uh, endpoint. So if you do kub control, get service. Uh, you'll see this, this is uh, the service artifact that's created for this. And node port is basically, uh, it, it, uh, the, the service is uh, exposed as a, a port in the Kubernetes master node. Uh, so that is basically uh, 31229. Uh, so any requests that uh, come to 31229 uh, will be load balanced across the, the pods uh, that I have for this service. Uh, yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, what yeah, Ballerina uh, gives you. Uh, you can use Ballerina to create uh, microservices, uh, and also it it will give you a flexibility to generate your Kubernetes artifacts. So you can uh, basically uh, have this service, uh, and uh, so let me remove any uh, Kubernetes annotations. Sorry? Then you manually generate later. Yeah, if you do that, you have to uh, generate la la later on. Yeah. So when you use the annotations uh, and, and, and at the build time, uh, it will be generated for you. I think uh, if you don't have any questions, uh, I, I think that's about it. So I'll be uh, hanging around. I'll be uh, here tomorrow as well. So love to if, if you if you're running uh, uh, Kubernetes or Docker, uh, would love to talk to you and about the possible use cases uh, that you may have. Thank you.